Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to take what we've talked about in terms of balance sheets and apply them on real companies. And as with my income statement analysis, I'm going to use a corporate life cycle to illustrate how balance sheets will shift over the corporate life cycle. Let's start with the young company. When you look at the balance sheet of a young company, you won't see much debt. No surprise, because a balance sheet is in a sense a reflection of the history of the company. The company's not been around. There's not much history to report. The asset base will be small, albeit growing fast. There will be very little or no debt unless it is taken as a last resort. Why? Because you can't afford debt if you're a very young company. And shareholders' equity could be a negative number. Now, that freaks some people out. You're saying, how can equity be negative? Well, if you keep losing money, you're a young company, equity can be negative. If you're a young growth company, your asset base will still be small, be growing quickly. The debt should still be low or non-existent, and your shareholders' equity might have turned positive. You know why? Not because the company is making money, but because it's getting infusions of equity from venture capitalists, from a public offering. Then you go to a high growth company, your asset base will continue to grow but offer a bigger base. Your debt will continue to stay low and your shareholders equity will start to build up because you're starting to make money. Then as a mature growth company, your asset base will stabilize, your debt will start to grow and your equity will, it will start to reflect the fact that you're now a mature growth company. It will grow because your retained earnings will build up. And then you get to be a mature, stable company. Your asset base is now stable. Your debt is often large and growing. Your equity might actually shrink. You know why? Because it depends on how much cash you return as a company. Your company could choose to pay large dividends, could choose to buy back stock, often funded with debt. So what happens to your shareholders' equity will reflect those choices. You're going to decline. Your asset base will start to decline. Your debt, if you're a healthy company, should decline with the asset base. Because if it doesn't, you're going to be in distress and your equity will decline. So let's look at companies across the life cycle to see how balance sheets play out. Let's again start with Peloton. Young company, early in its life cycle, and this is from its prospectors at the time of its public offering. Remember again, Peloton is a company which sells a very expensive fitness equipment and a subscription to go with that equipment, very expensive subscription. So let's highlight some items in the balance sheet that reflect its youth as a company. First, look at the total asset base. It's tiny, though it's growing very fast. It went from 271 million to 865 million. If you look at the shareholders' equity, it's negative. Why? Because the company's been losing money for a while. If you look at its biggest single asset, it's really cash and marketable securities. If you believe the balance sheet, the bulk of this value comes from the balance sheet. It's really not true because the bulk of its value comes from future growth, but future growth is not reflected on this balance sheet. That's a very young company. Let's move one step up the ladder again and look at Netflix. The first item I want you to point, to point to is its biggest asset is non-current content cost. This actually reflects the truth. I mean, of all the things Netflix owns, the content it owns, the TV shows, the movies are its biggest asset. And it actually shows up in the balance sheet. You see, why are you surprised? In many companies that get the bulk of the value from intangible assets, this is not the case. The biggest asset doesn't show up. Here it does. You'll notice the second item, if you go down to the current library, it says deferred revenue. You're saying, what is that? Netflix sells subscriptions. And when you sign a Netflix subscription, let's say it's for the next 12 months, it might collect its revenues up front. But it has to provide the service for the next 12 months. Those deferred revenues reflect collections it's made for services it needs to provide in the future. It's a deferred revenue. In a sense, it shows up as a current liability because these services are in the near term. And then on the common stock. It's one of the most useless items. I don't even know why companies report it anymore. It says 0.001 par value. I don't even know what that means, to be quite honest. It might have been a point in time, but people actually carried physical statements of stock certificates with a par value on it. I, you know, But it shows up. It's almost like a reverence for the past that, that it's in there. But this, again, as you look at the difference in Peloton and Netflix, you can see the substance shop on the balance sheet. Let's look at a third company, Coca-Cola more mature than Netflix. And there are some items on this balance sheet that I want to draw your attention to. The first is notice that the asset base is huge relative to Netflix and it's not growing very fast, reflecting the fact the company is mature. So, uh, among the assets you see, equity method investments. What are those? Those are the valuations that Coca-Cola is attaching to holdings it has in other companies. You're saying, how are those holdings valued? 
the only way you can find out is to actually go look at the footnotes and I did and it turned out that these holdings are not held for trading you're saying so what well remember if you hold uh, hold the, if you have holdings that are meant to be traded you got to mark them to market these are not me meant to be traded so they're not marked to market so those are book values and take it take them with a grain of salt second asset you see is deferred income tax assets remember Deferred taxes can show up as either assets or liabilities. When you show, see them showing up as assets, as you do with Coca-Cola, it basically means that Coca-Cola has overpaid taxes in a previous year, and that'll mean that they have to pay less tax in the future. So that's all it tells you. It doesn't mean you can go get this money right now if you liquidated the company, but your future taxes might be a little lower. Third, there's Goodwill. What does it tell you? Absolutely nothing other than the fact that Coca-Cola has done some acquisitions in the past and paid a high price. It really is, as I said, the most meaningless of assets. There's one final item, and this is an item that might throw you off. If you look under shareholders' equity, you'll see treasury stock. Coca-Cola buys back shares. It does stock repurchases. Not unusual among U.S. companies. And when you buy back shares, one of two things can happen. One is you can hold those shares as treasury stock. You know, and the other is you can cancel those shares, remove. Each has consequences. If you hold a treasury stock, it shows up on the balance sheet and you have the right or the, or the option to issue these shares back to the public next year, two years from now, five years from now. But they stay on as shares outstanding. If you cancel them, the number of shares in the company actually decreases. So when you see stock buybacks, in the statement of cash flows, one of the things to check to see is how is the company dealing with those shares it buys back. At least for the moment, Coca-Cola is holding them as treasury stock. Next year, they could decide to take these shares off the books, but for the moment, they're still there. What does it do? It reduces the book equity. Those shares are held and they reduce the book equity. So the shareholders' equity is being depressed by share buybacks. Something that might affect the way you compute returns and how you read those returns. Now, if you look at Coca-Cola's footnotes, they do give you some additional information. For instance, on their debt, they break their debt down. Perhaps not into as much detail as you would like, but you can see they've given you both the currency breakdown, the maturity breakdown, and some of the coupon rates. So basically, you see the breakdown of debt. In another table, they also tell you when the long-term debt comes to you, something that might be of consequence if you're doing forecasts of cash flows. Most companies with debt will provide this breakdown in the footnotes. Look for it. Now, if you look at the accounting, incidentally, when you look at that book debt, it also gives you the rate that you promised at the time you borrowed. It might. So let me go back to the previous page. It gives you the rate on the debt. That is not your cost of debt. That we'll talk about in the context of financial analysis. This is just called a book interest rate, the rate that they promised on the debt that they have. Now, of course, you look at Coca-Cola as an outsider and I asked you what's Coca-Cola's biggest asset. It's no contest, right? It's brand name. So if you're looking for brand name on Coca-Cola's balance sheet, you're going to be disappointed. Remember what, I, what, what we said about accounting, dealing with intangibles? It's small bore. Basically, they miss the big items. They focus on the small bore. Let me emphasize what, why I said that. If you look at the footnotes to Coca-Cola's balance sheet, they tell you what their in, in, intangible assets come from. Their biggest single intangible asset is goodwill. And remember what I said, goodwill measures. It measures the premium paid on acquisitions, nothing more, nothing less. You don't see brand name there. In fact, they spend a lot of time on what I call nonsense intangibles, customer relationship, bottle of franchise rights. Why nonsense? A collective caring value of these intangibles is less than a billion. For a company with a value of 200 billion, who really cares? So when accountants talk about intangibles, they talk the big game but they walk the small game. And you can see that with Coca-Cola. Final company in the life cycle series, let's look at Toyota. First, when you look at its accounting balance sheet, you can see the fact that it's a mature company. Why? By looking at its total assets. Total assets are almost frozen in place, just like its revenues. But if you look among its assets, you'll see a couple of items that should raise flags for you. The first is finance receivables. If you remember, I said Toyota is a financing division embedded in the company, a captive bank. And that bank makes loans to people who buy Toyota cars and equipment. In this case, those receivables show up as part of your current liabilities. You also see affiliated companies. You think, what are those? 
Remember that Coca-Cola had investments, equity investments in other companies and showed in the balance sheet as an asset. This is Toyota's analog. It's called affiliated companies, but basically it's investments made in other companies. Again, these are book values, not market values. Why? Because Toyota doesn't hold these investments for trading. Now, if you look at Toyota's liabilities, one of the items that is interesting is you see accrued pension and severance costs. Now, the reason I emphasize this is this is one of the items where I worry a little bit about differences across countries. In some countries, if you have uh, an underfunded pension plan, you know what I mean by an underfunded pension plan, your pension obligation, but you don't have assets to cover those obligations, you have to show it on your balance sheet as debt. You have to do that in Germany, you might have to do that in Japan, you might not have to do that in the US. In this case, these accrued pension and severance costs reflect liabilities to the company. Remember with, um, with Coca-Cola, taxes were an asset. Here, you have deferred income taxes show up as a liability. What does it tell you? Toyota has underpaid taxes in previous years, and those taxes will come due in the future. That's basically all it's telling you. But again, you will notice that Coca-Cola, it was an asset. With Toyota, it's a liability reflecting that one overpaid taxes, Coca-Cola, and the others underpaid taxes. Now, as with income statements, when you look across sectors, you will sometimes see line items that are specific to individual sectors. And as with income statements, I'm going to take you through three sectors, the commodity business. I'm going to take you through a financial service company and a pharmaceutical company. And I want to point out also that if you have acquisitive companies, you will often see items like good will show up on the accounting balance sheet that are specific to acquisition accounting. So let's take to top. It's an oil company. And one of the items I want to point to is inventory. You're saying, what's the big deal? Every company's inventories. Well, in the case of an oil company, that inventory takes the form of oil that's already extracted. You're saying, so what? Oil prices go up. Oil prices go down. So let's say you extracted the oil. At the end of 2019, when oil price was $60 a barrel, and that oil is still on your balance sheet in June when oil prices are at $35 a barrel. See the problem you're going to face? is that inventory has lost almost half its value. Unlike manufacturing companies where inventory is inventory and doesn't lose value overnight, with commodity companies it can, it will show up as an effect on the income statement. So it's something to watch out for commodity companies. And if you look at Total's liabilities, one of the items that you will see under shareholders equity is a currency translation adjustment. You're saying, what is that? When we talked about income statements, and I think there were at least a couple of companies where there were foreign currency losses and gains, we noticed how those how foreign exchange movements can cause income to go up and down. In many companies, they show up in the income statement as an expense. There's another way in which you can reflect those losses and gains. And that is rather than show it in the income statement, you could show it directly on the balance sheet as an addition to shareholders equity, if it's a gain or a drop. What I'm trying to say is there are some items which will show up in income statements in some companies and in balance sheets in others. Something to remember when you think about why is that line item there. Finally, on Toyota's liabilities, there are employee benefits. So as with um, uh, on Total's liabilities, there are employee benefits. As with Toyota, Total has benefits reflected in its balance sheet as a liability if it owes it, this to its employees. Now let's look at HSBC. First thing you notice when you look at uh, HSBC or any bank's balance sheet is so many of what's listed on the asset side, so many of the items are financial assets. You're saying, so what? Financial assets are easier to get market values for. And you know what? That mark-to-market convention that is now a trend in every company has been in banking for a long time. And the reason is most of its assets are financial assets. As you go down the line items, you can see why banks were the first in line to mark-to-market. If you look at the, the second line item I've highlighted here, non-controlling interest, that is basically a reflection of the fact that HSBC has consolidated a company. You know, remember we, we talked about consolidation? Where if you own more than 50%, you're required to act like you own 100%. It's a little strange, right? You're only 60%. I demand that you show 100% of the revenues, 100% of the income, 100% of the assets. You're saying, but I don't own 40%. Well, I wake up to it and accountants do at the last moment. And you know how it shows up? It shows up as a liability. That non-controlling interest is the accountant's estimate 
of the 40% of the consolidated company that doesn't belong to you. So because accounting consolidates, you will see this item on the liability side. It will often be called either minority interest in some companies or non-controlling interest. And it's usually in book value terms, an accounting estimate of value. Finally, if you look at uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's labs, it's a pharmaceutical company, right? If asked you what its biggest asset is, it must be all those patents that come from R&D. That must be on the balance sheet. Remember what I said when I showed you Coca-Cola's balance sheet? Accountants like to talk the big game, but they walk the small game. And you can see that reflecting Dr. Reddy's. Its biggest intangible asset is not on its balance sheet. In fact, if you look at its, uh, its intangibles, you see Goodwill, that ubiquitous item that shows up because of acquisitions, something called other intangible assets. And I went and checked that item to see brand name and R&D were in there. No, it's not in there. Dr. Reddy's biggest asset is off the books. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, you have an incredibly valuable patent that you developed yourself by doing R&D. Your balance sheet doesn't reflect that biggest asset. That's a problem, right? We'll come back and talk about how that plays out when we measure things like accounting returns. But already you can see differences across sectors. So what's the bottom line? A balance sheet is a reflection out of all the financials is a reflection of a company's history. If you start with that presumption, you can see already why balance sheets get substance as a company ages. That said, though, there is disagreement even among accountants as to what that history should reflect. The old time accountants argue that balance sheets reflect what you've actually invested in these assets, the capital invested in these assets. Well, that's starting to change with fair value accounting. Fair value accounting argues that the balance sheet reflect not what you paid for those assets, but what those assets are worth today. The end result is right now, balance sheets are neither fish nor fowl. They don't reflect capital invested nor fair value. In a sense, that's the worst of all worlds. I'm going to argue that balance sheets 35 years ago, in spite of all the limitations, you knew what was in the balance sheet. Today, with fair value accounting on some items and not on others, you're getting a mishmash. And that's getting in the way of our using balance sheets correctly. So when you look at a company's financial statements, take a look at the balance sheet. But remember again, it sends a mixed message. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you found the session useful.